As a creator in the sustainability sphere, I've been thinking a lot about the inherent contradiction of being a sustainable influencer. While I want to be paid fairly for my work, I also don't want to earn that money by compromising my values. In this video, I want to talk about some issues with traditional influencing, some alternatives, and reflections on my own journey. For some context, I'm not a full-time creator. I recently started a full-time job, which is one of the reasons it's been so long since my last video. But up until that, I had a freelance slash hourly job that provided my main source of income, but gave me the flexibility to work extensively on my blog and social accounts. Most of my sustainability work is also in the slow fashion niche, which is important to note because there's a lot of overconsumption in fashion especially. If you're new here, my name is Lily and I talk about sustainable fashion and living on this channel. I also have a blog about running, travel, and sustainability. So if you're into any of those things, I hope you'll stick around. Let's first talk about what influencers are exactly. The word is pretty self-explanatory. Influencers are public figures who have the power to influence or change their audience's behaviors. A lot of the time though, influencers are trying to sell you stuff. They've become synonymous with marketing and promoting consumption. As a result, the word influencer has a negative connotation and many creators try to distance themselves from the term. I personally prefer the word creator or digital storyteller myself. Over the past year though, I've been noticing a shift away from traditional lifestyle influencing towards educational influencing. There are more and more creators teaching people about important issues like sustainability rather than selling their shoppable lifestyles. So influencers can also have quite a positive impact. The creators I follow regularly teach me to live more mindfully, raise awareness on environmental justice and racial justice, and encourage me to unlearn the harmful narratives taught in schools or portrayed in mainstream media. On my platforms, I try to teach others about sustainable fashion and what people can do on a personal level while also pushing for systemic change. To understand how sustainable influencing can feel like a contradiction, we need to understand how influencers make money. Here are the main ways creators get paid. Number one is sponsorships. Social media influencers most commonly partner with brands to make money. Brands will pay to be featured in certain pieces of content like a blog post, TikTok, Instagram post, or YouTube video. The next is ads. Sponsorships are ads, but creators also often earn income from ad networks like Google AdSense on YouTube or Mediavine for blogs. You basically open up your platform for advertisers and you're paid a small amount each time someone views the ad. Next are affiliate links. Creators might talk about products in their posts and link to them. Anytime you buy through those links, influencers receive a small commission at no extra cost to you. Not every product link is an affiliate link, but many of them are. And finally, there are products and services. Sometimes creators will create their own digital or physical products, like an ebook about blogging or their own jewelry line. They might also offer consulting services like Pinterest management or blog audits. As you can see, most creators' income depends largely on promoting consumption. Sponsorships, affiliate links, and ads all rely on people buying something or the influencer encouraging their audience to buy something. At the same time, true sustainable living means buying less. It feels hypocritical to promote brands and receive free product as this is rooted in consumption. That being said, people will need to consume anyways, so one might argue that it's helpful to provide better, more sustainable options for when that does happen. In fact, brand-based content tends to perform the best for many sustainable creators. My sustainable brand videos regularly outperform my educational videos on TikTok. People are most curious about shopping better, probably because it feels like the most accessible change. It's much easier to switch brands than to tackle systemic issues or change your own consumption habits. But to even gain an audience for more serious, less glamorous topics, many creators choose to mix in some brand-based content because we know it will perform. I just try to avoid making it my focus and constantly remind my followers to reduce their consumption, buy use first, and advocate for the labor side of sustainable fashion as well. You have to walk a really fine line when sharing sustainable alternatives as there are creators who end up promoting an inaccurate image of sustainability. The mainstream sustainability movement tends to push the narrative that you can buy your way to sustainability when that's not the case at all. In fact, there seems to be a new wave of sustainable fashion influencers who are solely focused on promoting sustainable brands and outfits. Sustainable fashion isn't only about where we buy from. In fact, I argue that brands are overemphasized in the movement. What's way more important is reducing consumption and advocating for garment worker rights. 
We need more literacy on getting creative with what you own and tackling important issues in the industry. Other influencers will continue to partner with fast fashion brands despite saying that they care about sustainability. And sure, no one is perfect as an individual, but individual consumption is totally different from promotion. Yes, maybe your followers can't afford sustainable brands, but actively endorsing companies that mistreat their workers and pollute the earth doesn't seem like the right solution. People know where to go to find cheap clothes if that's what they need. Another prominent issue is when celebrities and influencers help fast fashion companies with their greenwashing campaigns. H&M came under fire recently after appointing Game of Thrones star Maisie Williams as their sustainability ambassador. And Laura Whitmore, Love Island host, also got a lot of backlash for her role as a Primark Cares ambassador. These influencer partnerships only end up confusing the general public about sustainability. Companies like H&M and Primark can never be sustainable because of their scale. Their entire business models are focused on overproduction and exploitation. It doesn't matter how many recycling programs they implement or how many sustainable collections they create. To be totally fair, I want to point out that it's actually pretty tough to make decent money as a creator, especially those with smaller accounts. I get one to two brand offers daily, but 99% of them don't pan out because the brand isn't sustainable enough or is plain sketchy or it's not a good fit for my lifestyle or style or the brand doesn't want to pay me fairly. Brands are actually notorious for taking advantage of influencers, even ethical brands. I've had a so-called sustainable vegan bag brand offer me a 45 pound voucher for three TikTok videos. And the kicker is that their products were over 150 pounds each. I've had another greenwashing shoe company offer $300 total for a blog post, YouTube video, and TikTok. Don't even get me started on all the sustainable brands that want to pay me in product only. I get that small businesses don't always have the budget to pay creators, but this happens with even companies that have a marketing department and person in charge of influencer partnerships. It happens even with companies that hire PR agencies. And even if you're a small brand, you have to understand that most creators don't have the bandwidth to advertise for free. It's a lot of work to put together a poster video. Brand deals also come at an opportunity cost as that's less time you have to create your own content. You also technically have to pay taxes on gifted product that's offered as compensation. So you're basically paying to work for free, both financially and in terms of time. Instead of giving bloggers raises, affiliate programs are also constantly slashing commission rates or getting rid of their programs altogether. The latest upset was Airbnb cutting its affiliate program just a month in advance when many travel bloggers had gone all in on creating Airbnb focused guides. As your platform grows, these issues are mitigated because more companies are willing to work with you and you can also hire managers or agencies to coordinate sponsorships where you're paid fairly. This also saves you the time and mental space of negotiating contracts. It doesn't really solve affiliate program woes, but it at least helps one income stream. Is there an 100% ethical way to make money? I don't bring this up as a cop out, but I think it's important to recognize that we all probably have to make some sort of value compromise when earning a living. For instance, is it wrong for people to work at unsustainable companies like Amazon or H&M. I know someone passionate about sustainable fashion who worked at Gap for years. I know other people who care deeply about social justice who work for Amazon. I know people who care about animal welfare but work in science and need to experiment on mice. And even if you don't work at an inherently problematic company, these bad businesses may be your company's clients or maybe the company is owned by corporate giants. You work at Whole Foods, owned by Amazon. You work for an architecture firm and have to design a prison. You work at a statistical consulting firm and have to help pharmaceutical companies find the best price to make the most profits. It's a privilege to earn income in a way that aligns with your values. And if you have that privilege, I think you should try to work at a company you believe in. But that's easier said than done, especially in a pandemic and especially in a capitalistic society. Some might argue that we need people in these unsustainable spaces to push for change. But at the same time, major corporations like that are highly unlikely to change their whole business model. So it might be fruitless. I don't want people to excuse willful influencer greenwashing just because everyone needs to make money. Everyone does need to make money and making money ethically is hard, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Promoting brands is also more visible and should be held to a higher standard, in my opinion. 
It's one thing to be a cog in the machine at Amazon, but another to personally endorse them to thousands of people. The ethics of making money as a creator isn't well defined, and I see it as a sliding scale. I'm not going to say it's right for a sustainable blogger to promote Amazon or H&M, for example, but what about these scenarios? Advertising the release of Dove's refillable deodorant. Dove is owned by Unilever, a corporate giant known for human rights violations and being a top plastic polluter. At the same time, Dove's products are more accessible physically and cost-wise than those of niche sustainable brands. Dove has also funded a coalition to advance legislation that prevents race-based hair discrimination. Working with Nike on a WNBA and women's empowerment campaign. Nike is known for not paying workers fairly, potentially using forced labor, and mistreating its athletes, particularly women. Partnering with Love, Beauty, and Planet and consulting for them to improve their sustainability measures. Unfortunately, they're also owned by Unilever. Sharing the release of Fossil's plant-based cactus leather bag. Fossil as a company isn't ethical or sustainable though. It is nice to see larger companies make improvements, but these ultimately feel like greenwashing campaigns. Does it matter if Dove's deodorant is refillable if their parent company is still responsible for 70,000 tons of pollution each year? To what extent can you separate the brand from the parent company? These are all partnerships I've seen my fellow BIPOC creators take, and I don't judge them for it because I respect that it's a complicated decision and difficult to make money, especially as a person of color. Many of them were also able to provide feedback to these companies to help them improve. We also need to keep in mind that these companies are paying these creators, which ultimately allows them to continue creating educational content for free. These companies also tend to pay much, much better than small sustainable businesses, meaning creators can take fewer sponsor sponsorships overall and still make a sufficient income. But that being said, creators have to walk a fine line between providing for themselves and being complicit in greenwashing. Luckily, I usually see eco-creators work with small sustainable companies more than they do with these larger corporations that have small sustainability initiatives. I myself recently worked with a payment plan company that allows you to split online purchases into interest-free installments. On TikTok, I shared some sustainable brands offering this service and hosted a giveaway for gift cards to those brands. I know that by now pay later services can encourage overconsumption and debt, but at the same time, when used responsibly, it can help people budget for expensive purchases from sustainable brands. It can also help ethical brands compete with fast fashion brands, which are way cheaper. Their PR agency was also super professional and agreed to pay me fairly. I was not 100% comfortable with the payment plan sponsorship, but I believed it to be a net positive for the slow fashion movement, which is why I accepted it. In the end, there's not going to be a perfect partnership or way to make money entirely ethically, but if we carefully consider the nuance and try to stay true to our values, I'd say that that's pretty darn good. Let's talk about some alternatives to brand deals. While most influencers make money in traditional ways, there are other income streams that allow you to stay closer to your values. Number one is Patreon. Patreon allows you to pay creators directly for exclusive content. You pay a certain amount monthly and get access to things like Q&As, voting rights on content, or Patreon-only blog posts. One of the most prominent sustainable fashion activists, Asia Barber, uses Patreon as her main platform. A direct pay system solves for the problem of promoting consumption to make money, but it does make your content less accessible. It's also typically not a feasible option for small creators, as you usually only get a very small percentage of followers to join Patreon. I would love to be paid directly for my work, but the idea of actively creating content for yet another platform really stresses me out, as I barely have enough time for my regular platform as it is. I do think Patreon would be a good option if I were a full-time creator though. Number two, digital products and services. Instead of selling other companies physical products, you can create your own digital ones. I've seen creators make ebooks on how to make money blogging, video courses on Google web stories, or calculators on how much to charge for brand deals. You also see people selling Lightroom presets or providing consulting services to brands and other creators. I think selling your own products or services is a pretty smart business strategy as you're not depending on a brand or affiliate program to treat you fairly. I'd love to offer my own digital products someday, but I'm not sure yet what would be helpful, so feel free to leave some suggestions. I have consulted once for a sustainable brand and it was cool to be part of that development process and I would do it again, but I also realized that consulting would take me away from creating my own content. Number three, speaking. 
you can be paid to share your knowledge at events or workshops. I actually recently gave a virtual talk at a university in the UK, but it was unpaid. I'd love to do more talks, but it's really difficult finding paid gigs if you're not a very prominent figure, especially since it's usually nonprofits who invite sustainability creators to speak. Number four, promoting service-based brands. While this option still relies on selling something to your audience, service-based brands feel more ethical because they're not based in consumerism. You could promote educational platforms, clothing repair services, or apps to help you make the most of your closet. Reflecting on my own journey, I personally try to focus on educational content, but also throw in some brand-based content for income and exposure. When I do write brand-based posts, I aim to be very thorough and also discuss the brand's areas of improvement, like in my guide to sustainable underwear. I haven't really taken a lot of sponsorships because most brands don't meet my standards or refuse to pay me fairly. If I do take brand deals, I make sure that the brand is trustworthy, that I'm properly compensated, and that I'll actually use the gifted item items or find someone else who will. I'm not 100% comfortable with my income generating content, but I will always encourage readers and followers to shop mindfully and buy used when possible. The business side of blogging is actually my least favorite part. I find it exhausting to coordinate brand deals, update affiliate links, and create the content itself. It's just not exciting to me to create ads or research products and brands. Because of the inherent ethical dilemma, income generating posts also cause me a lot of anxiety and take up significant mental space. My favorite content is more philosophical or analytical like this video and it doesn't directly generate me any income at all. I've been thinking a lot lately about my relationship with blogging. It used to be something I did for fun, but now that it's generating income, it's become work. I feel pressured to post daily on TikTok, write a blog post per week for this blog and my other site, make two YouTube videos per month, except I never do that, and upload consistently to Instagram. It's really overwhelming and it's not financially efficient. One of the reasons I took a full-time job was so that I can focus on making content I actually enjoy and think less about the money. But at the same time, I know working full-time means less time to create. It's something that I'm trying to balance, but I wanted to deal less with brands and it felt like the right decision. The work I do is also for an education startup that offers free college admissions resources, so it's also one of the more ethical jobs out there and I feel good about that. So here is my pledge to you. I don't ultimately blog to make money. I blog because I want to help people live more mindfully, share my experiences, and push for meaningful change. This is why I want to make these pledges to you all. Number one, I will only take brand deals that I believe are a net positive for the sustainability movement, my followers, and me. I can't realistically promise to eliminate brand-based content altogether, but I do promise to remain as true to my values as possible and reject greenwashing campaigns that would only benefit me and corporate giants. I will thoroughly consider the nuances and only accept offers that ultimately benefit the sustainability movement. You might not agree with everything I do, and I myself might not be totally comfortable with everything I do, but I ask for empathy and an open dialogue. I am always happy to explain why I chose to take a partnership. And number two, I will donate at least 10% of my take-home blog income to grassroots environmental justice orgs or mutual aid. If my blog isn't only for myself, it only seems right to give back to the communities I want to advocate for. This donation will be on top of the money I regularly give from my main source of income. And with this pledge, we'll hopefully be able to make a real impact outside of this little online bubble. If you made it through this ramble, thank you so much for watching. If you're a fellow creator, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and whether you've been grappling with this yourself. If you're a viewer and not a creator, I appreciate you sticking with me throughout this and I'd love to hear your perspective as well. As usual, the text version of this video will be over on my blog and that will be linked below. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.